Evening, everyone. Please direct your attention to the screen. We'll never own up to our past. We'll never build sustainable cities. We'll never set foot on another planet. We'll never stop the overdose crisis. We'll never find a cure for Alzheimer's. We'll never treat each other as equals. We'll never clean up our oceans. But together, together, we have the potential. We have the potential to shape a different future. Different future. A different future. Welcome to UBC Connects. For today's event, we'll be using a web-based platform called Slido. It lets you ask questions in real time. It works on any mobile device, so take out yours and follow along. We'll show you how to get started. Although we do want you to use your device, please make sure it's on silent, as we don't want to interrupt the program. Now, once you've confirmed that your device is on silent, pull up your browser and go to slido.com. Now enter the event code UBC Connects. You'll see the hashtag symbol is already populated. All you need to do is enter UBC Connects, all one word. Now you're all set to submit your questions by clicking on the Ask button. Other people can like your question by giving it a thumbs up. When we get to the question and answer part of the program, our moderator will ask the top rated questions first. You can start submitting questions, but they won't be visible until the moderator appears. At that point, you can start voting. Before you go, we have one more thing to ask. We'd like you to take out that mobile device one last time and go to the polling tab. That's where you'll see a few questions about your event experience. Please do take a moment. Your feedback matters to us. Enjoy the program. Please welcome to UBC Students Union Okanagan President Amal Alhuwaisal. Good evening and welcome. My name is Amal al Huayshel and I'm the president of the UBC Okanagan Students Union. It is my great pleasure to welcome everyone here today, this evening. We are thrilled that so many of you have joined us tonight, in the room as well as online, for the first installment of UBC Connect series here in the Okanagan. In a few moments, Professor Ono will tell you more about the series. But first and foremost, we respectfully acknowledge the Selix Okanagan Nation and their peoples, in whose territory we are gathered on today. Tonight, we will hear a presentation from Tarana Burke, and I, for one, am very thrilled. Earlier today, Tarana Burke have spoke on our UBCO campus, and I had the honor to MC and moderate the event. And my biggest takeaway from the event that to challenge rape culture, we need to speak and re-socialize our norms. We need to speak to the three-year-olds about sex and about consent. And as per for us, the adults, we just need to be on board with that. I was born and raised in Saudi Arabia. I was covered from head to toes since I was in third grade. And one of the reasons and the teachings of why you should be fully covered up in that part of the world and everywhere in the world is that you need to protect yourself from sexual violence. And yet, it still happens. This prevalence indicates that sexual violence is deeply rooted in systems of oppression and privilege. The Me Too movement have gained momentum, international momentum, in so many countries. However, in Saudi Arabia, the movement is not yet prevalent. Survivors there and across the world continue to be silenced. Today, we're gathering here to challenge that silence by engaging in a dialogue about sexual violence. Today, let us all be inspired 
let us all learn about our role towards a world free from sexual violence. Following Ms. Burke's presentation, the program will continue with a moderated in conversation and a Q&A with the audience. Tonight, the program is being live streamed for those who could not be with us in person. In the coming days, an audio podcast as well as some video clips will be posted on the event website at ubc.ca slash ubcconnects so you, are, you can revisit or share with the family and your friends. As you just saw, for the Q&A, we will be using an online audience engagement platform called Slido to include everyone in the conversation, even for those of you online can participate. As a reminder, you are able to submit your questions now and throughout Ms. Perk's presentation. But we're going to be holding off posting the questions that you submit for all to see until the moderator takes the stage. At that time, you will be able to begin voting on all the submitted questions. If you would like to tweet during the program, please use at UBC and hashtag UBC Connects. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Deputy Vice Chancellor and Principal of UBC Okanagan Campus. Professor Deborah Buzzard is a hearty cultural scientist, strawberry breeder, and professor of biology in UBC's Arvind K. K. Hart Barber School of Arts and Science. Please welcome Deborah Buzzard. Thank you very much, Amal, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I have the amazing privilege of serving as the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Principal of UBC's extraordinary Okanagan campus. And I have the really distinct pleasure of welcoming you all to the very first event in the UBC Connects public lecture series to be presented here in the Okanagan. Occasions like this are a really important part of UBC's commitment to public dialogue. We have other special events, and you may know of them, like the Distinguished Speaker Series, the UBC Okanagan Annual Nobel Night, and UBC Dialogues that help us fulfill our commitment to be both a place of learning and research, but also of engagement that advances a sustainable and just society. We are delighted at UBC Okanagan to be partnering with AMAL and the UBC Students' Union to bring tonight's speaker, Ms. Tarana Burke, to Kelowna to address a topic that is of incredible importance to our students, to the university, to our community, and to me. Tarana Burke is a founding voice in the Me Too movement. She is a powerful advocate for survivors and an inspiring voice for all of us who dream of a world free from sexual violence, racism, and sexism. I'm really looking forward this evening to hearing her message of empowerment. All of us in this room who share Tirana's dream have a role to play in helping us as a society to actually get there and not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. I can't wait to hear about the tools that we can all use to help get there. Before I close, I need to say a few very important thank yous to individuals and organizations who've made this evening possible. First, thank you to our wonderful Students' Union, to Alumni UBC, to the UBC Equity and Inclusion Office, the UBC Sexual Violence Prevention and Response Office, and the many colleagues at UBC Okanagan and UBC's Vancouver campus who worked very hard to ensure that we could come here and enjoy our first UBC Connects in the Okanagan. Earlier, Amal noted that following Tarana's remarks, she will be joined by a moderator to help facilitate the question and answer portion of the evening. I'm very pleased to note that the moderator will be Professor Alison Conway, 
Allison is a distinguished professor of English and Gender and Women's Studies, holding appointments in our Faculty of Creative and Critical Studies and the Irving K. Barber School of Arts and Science at UBC Okanagan. She's a wonderful colleague and I know you'll enjoy meeting her later in the program. It's now my pleasure to introduce the president of UBC. Professor Santa J. Ono is the 15th president and vice chancellor of the University of British Columbia. He's a professor of medicine in UBC's Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. Professor Ono's research focuses on the area of the immune system, eye inflammation, and age-related macular degeneration. Santa is also a committed advocate for mental health and for overcoming the stigma of mental illness. He's also an accomplished cellist and perhaps already a familiar face to many of you on social media. Please join me in welcoming my boss, Santa Ono. Well, thank you, Deborah. It's really wonderful to be here in the Okanagan. I'm excited to be here and welcome you to the very first UBC Connects uh, lecture in the Okanagan, and it will be one of many. I'd like to welcome all of those uh, who are actually joining us through live stream. UBC Connects is a public lecture series that features the world's most esteemed thought leaders, and that's certainly true today, and focuses on the pressing global issues. We've had some great uh, guest speakers already over the past year, and the events have been immensely popular, often selling out within minutes. As Deborah mentioned, there are many partners who have helped make this event possible. First of all, I'd like to thank Deborah herself and the Office of the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Principal. And I also need to thank the UBC Student Union of Okanagan for their partnership on this event. I'd also like to recognize and thank our colleagues at the Alumni UBC for their support of this series. And the UBC Equity and Inclusion Office, the Sexual Violence Prevention and Response Office, UBC Okanagan, for their support of tonight's event. We are delighted that you have joined us for tonight's program, and we hope that you will continue to join us in subsequent uh, lectures. For more information on the UBC Connect series and future events and live streams, I encourage you to go to our website, ubc.ca backslash UBC Connects. Now, just a few words about our featured speaker. Toronto Burke is a civil rights activist who has dedicated more than 25 years of her life to social justice. In 2006, she began using the phrase, Me Too, to help young women of color who survived sexual abuse and assault. The phrase developed into a broader movement following the 2017 use of the hashtag Me Too as a hashtag on Twitter, becoming the now globally recognized phenomena that continues to raise awareness about sexual harassment, abuse, and assault in societies around the world. A sexual assault survivor herself, Tarana Burke, is now working under the banner of the Me Too movement to assist other survivors and those who work to end sexual violence forever. Her continued work with the Me Too movement has earned her several honors. In 2017, Time magazine named Burke among a group of other prominent female activists dubbed the Silence Breakers as the Time Person of the Year. More recently, she was named the Route 100's most influential person of 2018 and received the 2018 Ridenauer Prize for Courage Award. And in November last year, she delivered a talk at TED Women, which has now been viewed 
over 1.1 million times. Tarana is currently Senior Director of Programs at the Brooklyn-based Girls for Gender Equity Program. Her upcoming book, Where the Light Enters, discusses the importance of the Me Too movement, as well as her personal journey from victim to survivor to thriver. It is our absolute pleasure to welcome Tarana Burke to the UBC Connect series. Let's give her a round of applause. Hello, Kelowna. Hello. I really like saying Kelowna. <laughs> Kelowna. It's a what? It means the bear. Oh, you shouldn't have told me that. <laughs> <laughs> I like polar bears better. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. Yeah. Now I can see everybody. Look at that. Oh, I'm so, I'm, I'm the age now where they, they've renamed bifocals progressives. Did y'all know that? <laughs> Try to make us feel better, but really it's bifocals, so I'm, I'm like this all the time. So bear with me, I'm going to take them on and off about a hundred times during this talk. How's everybody doing? Oh, like now. Okay. <laughs> the problem is when you look up suddenly, you can't see anything on the bottom. So I feel like I have to do like this all the time. Okay, I'm sorry. How are you doing? Good, good, good. I've spent a lot of time in Canada lately, boy. But I haven't been to Kelowna, so this is a first. But I have been crisscrossing Canada and the United States and really around the world for the last year and a half, talking about the Me Too movement ever since its explosion. And I'm happy to do it because, one, it beats when I used to have to pay people to let me talk about it sexual violence. Um, and two, I think it's really important that people understand where this movement came from, um, the foundations of it, how it got started, so that when we talk about where we're going, it's not unfamiliar, and that people understand that it is rooted in a body of work that is still viable and still important, and the vision hasn't changed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, and a little bit about how I got started. Um, what we're doing now and where we're going. Okay? I need energy. Come on, Kelowna. All right. Yes. Nobody likes to be bored. So I asked this question when I was talking to students earlier and only one person knew. Let's see. Do you know where I'm from? Oh, come on. This is what I'm talking about. Come on. And I got a BX? Did you see that? Colonia, you're my favorite now. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, did you? Oh, these are my people. Yeah. Well, I talk about the Bronx a lot because I love being from the Bronx. And, you know, between me, Cardi B, and Alexandria, we're trying to take over the world. <laughs> um, but also because people think about the Bronx and, in in, you know, just like some other places, when you hear it, they, I get the craziest questions like, are you from the projects? I mean, I am but it's neither here nor there. I was born and raised in the Bronx. I currently reside in Harlem. And I had um, an average working class family, if you call left-leaning social activist kind of people average. <laughs> I had a, a grandfather who was a Garveyite. And um, although I was raised going to Catholic school, his only mandate for me was that if I was going to read the Bible, I had to read a history book along with it. <laughs> and I had a mother, I have a mother, who is a black feminist and raised me wrapped in black feminist literature. And so I was reading books that most people don't read until college in the seventh and eighth grade, um, which made for a very interesting conversation with my middle school teachers. I was that know-it-all kid who was like, my grandfather said that Abraham Lincoln didn't free the slaves. 
And my teacher be looking everywhere like, is anybody else? Does anybody else want to answer this question? <laughs> Um, but that's who I was as a kid, and it was great, and it was great to have that information because what that upbringing did was help me to identify injustice when I saw it. I was able to call it out. I was able to name it when I saw it at a very early age. But the only problem was, although I had that information and I could name injustice, I didn't feel like I had the tools to do anything about it. I could just say, look, this is what I, I know what's happening to this person in this community. I see what's happening around me. But it wasn't until I, uh, about 14, I joined an organization called the 21st Century Youth Leadership Movement. And 21st Century um, was founded by veterans of the civil rights and labor and black power movements of the 60s and 70s. And really, those people just wanted to make sure that the next generation of young people carried on this rich legacy of work that they started. So they created 21st Century. I joined, and the underlying um, mission of the organization is to train young people to be grassroots community organizers. And so that's what I did. I became an organizer at 14. And it just so happened that in New York in the late 80s and the early 90s, we had a period of time very similar to what happened in the United States in 2012, 2013, 2014, following Trayvon Martin's murder and the onset of Black Lives Matter. We had uh, the murder of a young man named Yusef Hawkins. We had the Central Park Five case, which is the case that actually really politicized me. So the first thing I ever organized around was that case. And I threw myself into being an organizer. I loved it. I loved the idea that what the elders in my organization told me was that I had power now. That I would always grow and learn and add to it, but I had the power and the tools right now to make change around me. And that's what I was looking for. I wanted to do more than just read books and know history. I wanted to be active in doing something like the people I read about in the books. And so 21st Century helped shape, along with my family, helped shape my consciousness and helped shape who I was. And I really believed in the power of organizing and the power of community. I went to college and continued to do that work. I actually went to college in Alabama. And well, you know, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Moving to Alabama from New York was more than a notion. <laughs> but I went to college in Alabama, and it was very different from when I went to visit Alabama as a high school student, because now I was on a major college campus that was predominantly white in the Deep South and had no real um, race relations, if you will, happening on campus. And so again, I found myself organizing around issues of racial injustice and even economic injustice. But I had yet to come to the place where I could deal with the injustice that had happened to me. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't even know what to call it. And so this thing that I was holding in my body, I decided to take that pain and pour it into something else. And I poured it into my work. When I finished school, I went to work for 21st Century. They're based in Selma, Alabama. And so people know Selma, obviously, from the history. But in actuality, Selma, besides having this rich history, is just a small town in the South. And they have a lot of small town problems. And oftentimes, we find out that small towns are really just microcosms of bigger places, right? just concentrated in a smaller geographical location. So when I went to live in Selma, my job at 21st Century was running our leadership camp. So the leadership camp is the crux of the organization. It is the tool that we use to really get information to young people who are doing all kind of work in their local communities all year. But it's the one time in the summer we come together for 10 days, and it's wonderful. Camps had changed my life growing up. So I was very excited to be camp director. Um, in the summer of 1996, I was, it was my second camp, year of running camp, and I met a young girl who 
publicly I call heaven. Um, and heaven was, you know, what's the word? A hellion. <laughs> heaven was a handful. She was, I would get up in the morning and you know, the kids have to get up at six o'clock in the morning because somebody somewhere said that waking up early <laughs> makes you a better leader. <laughs> but the kids would get up really early in the morning so that means I had to be up earlier than them and I would walk across the campus and I, could, I would wait to hear where heaven was. I could hear somewhere she was yelling at somebody or somebody was yelling at her or there was some commotion and I'd be like, oh, there she is. And I'd find her and I'd bring her with me. And so she was with me a lot. I would, she was my little helper. You know, that's the universal adult strategy to make children feel special. <laughs> but it works. And she was with me a lot and I kept her close and I gave her little assignments because there was something about her that I recognized that I wanted to nurture. And we had a great relationship. Every year at camp, though, we had these sessions that we called brother to brother and sister to sister. It was the 90s. We didn't really have a gender analysis. But <laughs> it came later. But at this point, we just separated the boys and the girls and gave them space to talk about anything they wanted. It was really everybody's favorite time in camp. And when I was in camp, it was my favorite time. It was where the, you know, the kids, the girls would come together and they would ask all kind of questions. There was no judgment. They could ask anything they wanted to. And it was a way for us to build trust and connection with the young people. And although I love Sister to Sister every year, because there was so much trust and because there was so much comfortability with, between us and the young people, every year after the questions about boyfriends and the questions about friends and fashion and what have you, at some point, there would always be a turn because the girls would start disclosing their experiences with sexual violence. It happened like clockwork every year. And by this time, we were fully prepared for it. We had counselors on site. We were, you know, we had gone through some sort of training. But I was never, ever really prepared. In fact, even when I was a camper, I never talked about it. Because the other thing my family is is Caribbean. And, um, I think at everybody, every Caribbean household, the number one family rule is our business is our business. And so it just seemed unrealistic that I would talk to people, any people, even if I trusted them about this thing that I had been holding. So I never told. This particular year during um, Sister to Sister, Heaven was in the room. It was her first time because it was her first camp. And I remember watching her struggle. And I recognized she was struggling because I recognized myself because that's how I was in that room when I was that age. And I, rec I watched her try to figure out if she should say something. I watched her shift in her seat uncomfortably. I watched her looking to see where she can insert herself in a conversation and change her mind. So she never said anything that night. The next day, she makes a beeline for me. She's like, Miss T, I need to talk to you. And I knew it was coming. I was super clear about what was happening. And I wanted no part of it. I was 21, 22. I was 22 maybe. Or maybe I was going to turn 22. I was a baby. I know some of the students out here who are 21 resent that, but. <laughs> you see these people laughing? <laughs> You'll figure it out. <laughs> and so I felt unprepared. In fact, I had not really dealt with my own stuff. And so when this child came to me and finally cornered me and said, I have to talk to you, insisted on talking to me because I had presented myself to her as somebody she could trust. I had presented myself to her as somebody who cared for her deeply and wanted to protect her. And so she rightfully came to me and said, I need to give this to you. Except it was a misrepresentation on a small level because although I felt for her emotionally, I was not prepared for what she had to say. I wasn't prepared for what she had to say because what she had to say ran right up against what I could not say. And so she starts 
just pouring her heart out about all these things that happened to her at the hands of her mother's boyfriend, who she called her stepfather. And I listened, and I don't know how long it was. In my mind, it feels like you know, 20 minutes, but it probably was just five before I cut her off. And I said, I can't help you. I was standing there listening to her, thinking in myself intellectually, I don't know what to say. I'm not a counselor or a social worker or a therapist. I don't want to say the wrong thing, and I don't know what to say. But the thing that was on my heart to say was, this happened to me too. I had never said that to anybody. Not in a way that didn't imply that I was complicit in my own abuse but the face that I was looking at, this small face that I was looking at made me realize that this is what I looked like when it happened to me. And I don't wanna do anything but protect this small child in the ways that nobody protected me. And I felt so bad that I could not even leave her with the one thing nobody ever gave to me, which is the comfort in knowing that I wasn't alone because this happened to me too. And so I didn't say it. And up until very recently, really, until Me Too went viral, I carried that story as my greatest shame. It was my greatest failure, I should say, not necessarily shame. But it felt like a failure. It felt like the big thing I did to fail a young person. And I remember when people started, you know, it's funny when, of course, I wasn't prepared for Me Too to go viral. Um, and for people to like want to know about my life. So when reporters first started asking me about it and they would say, tell us about heaven. And I was like, felt like somebody had read my journal, right? Because it was on our website and I forgot. It's like, <laughs> the website was old, right? I just didn't visit it that much. And <laughs> there was a portion of the website that was like, this is the inception. And, um, and I forgot. And so I remember the first reporter who asked me that, I burst into tears. Um, more than one time, because it's a hard story. And so the funny thing is, one of my kids, because you know, if you work with young people, particularly in the community, you should know that these kids don't ever leave. They don't ever leave. I have grown women nowadays, I can be walking through a supermarket like, Miss T! I'm like, it's one of my kids. <laughs> but one of my children, who I love dearly, called me up and said to me, how come every time I see you on TV, you crying? <laughs> she said, you always talking about this heaven. I don't even know who that is. And you crying over her. And she just was going on and on. And this is a 34-year-old woman. Let's just, let's just say that. And, and I said, because I'm emotional. I just, you know, people keep asking me about it. I hadn't thought about it in years. And she said, you know what? So that story with heaven happened in 96. I met this girl in 98. And she said, um, when I met you, and I was running these programs for girls, it didn't have a name. We didn't call it Me Too. I hadn't started my organization, Just Be, yet. It was just a thing we did in the community. And she was a part of that. And she said, when I met you, we called it the circle. And she said, and I was in the circle, you were the second person I ever told what happened to me. But you were the first person to believe me. And just the idea that you believed me changed my life, which is also why I can't get rid of him. <laughs> and so when we started doing this work, officially, when we started doing work around Me Too and sexual violence, it was really to fill a void. There was a, a deficit in our community. Some years after that, just a few years after that, I started an official organization, not around sexual violence, but about girls and leadership. And the same thing happened that happened when I, we had created the same space with Heaven. You create safety for young people in particular, and they start to disclose. But this time it was a little bit different. These young people who were disclosing in our community, in school, we were in a junior high school. Sometimes they would come and say, you know, this thing happened to me. Um, I want to talk about it. But other times, they were just talking about their lives. And what we recognized was the violence in their lives. I had a student one day who I was, um, you know, 
it was after school and she was waiting outside for her ride. And I just happened to come outside because I happened to be at the school late. And I said, why are you here? And she said, oh, I'm waiting for my boyfriend to pick me up. I was in seventh grade. So I imagined some scrawny little kid rolling up on a bicycle, you know, telling her to hop on. Imagine my surprise when the 21-year-old man drove up in his car. Funny thing is, I knew who he was because just the year prior, I had chased him away from the hotel where our teenage, our high school girls had a sleepover. So now we're talking about a predatory person, right? So he gets out the car. Well, he doesn't get out the car yet. And I said, who is, who is the, are you talking about this person? And she said, uh, yes, that's my boyfriend. And I said, you wait here. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> but I did have a conversation with that young man um, and reminded him this is a small town and I knew where he lived. Chasing him away really wasn't the issue, right? Because I could threaten him within an inch of his life, because I didn't know where he lived. I could tell him that I would call the cops. I could, you know, give him all kinds of threats to make him know that he can't mess with this child. That really wasn't the problem. The problem that I had was the next day. The next day, I had to deal with a very angry seventh grader who was mad at me for breaking up her relationship. And then I had to figure out what language I could use to explain to this child that this is not a relationship, this is a crime. And the reason why it was difficult is because nobody had ever said it. The problem that we saw in this community, and it's the same problem that so many of us have right now, is that people did not have language to describe what was happening to them. I, I always compare it to my daughter. I have a 21-year-old daughter, but when my child was maybe two, you know, they ran a really high fever. And of course, because I was a young mother, I ran to the hospital with them. And of course, everything was fine. But my inquisitive child, when we got home, kept saying, mommy, why do we go to the doctor at nighttime? You know, that's not a usual occurrence. And I said, oh, because you were sick, you had a fever. And they kind of listened and thought about it. And then for weeks after that, every time something happened, they would stub their toe and be like, mommy, I have a fever in my foot. <laughs> or get a scratch and be like, I have a fever in my arm. And it was cute, but I always think about it because, in fact, my daughter didn't have language to describe her pain. She didn't have words to tell me exactly where it hurt. And that's what was happening with the young people in our program. Not only did they not have language, they didn't have an environment where you could even talk about this. It wasn't normalized. People often wonder why Me Too spread like wildfire. But it spread like wildfire because people were peeking out and saying, wait, I can talk about this? I can say it out loud? There's no shame here? I was dealing with little black and brown girls in Selma, Alabama, who nobody said you are not the sum total of the things that happened to you. Nobody said healing is possible. Who has said that to us? Any of us in our lifetime. It wasn't just them. Me Too spread like wildfire because people need to hear that. They need to know that. The other problem, though, in that community is that there were no resources. And so once we got to the place where the young people could say me too, we had to figure out what to do with them next. And again, it's the same issue that we have now. There were 12 million people who used the me too hashtag in 24 hours on Facebook, just on Facebook. 12 million people. When I think about that, and I think about, you know, I often compare it to, to a, a breakout. You know, they have those movies where like some wild disease happens and it just spreads like wildfire and you have to quarantine people and it's like, you know, Tom Cruise comes in and he has to like get the valve to cure everybody. But think about that. If 12 million people tomorrow caught some kind of incurable disease, would we talk about it the way people talk about me too? 
Could you imagine people saying, oh, this disease has spread like wildfire. How will we date? Can we mentor people who have this disease? I don't think so. Oh, they're trying to take us down with this disease. Everybody doesn't have it. That's what we're doing. That's what's happening. It's been a little over a year. And I'm learning to take the good with the bad because I am very grateful for this moment. I am very grateful that we have an opportunity to have international conversations about sexual violence. And I meant what I said. I, d I have literally paid people to put me on the agenda in, in this lifetime. I've gone to places and begged them to say, can we, can we add a little bit, a little portion here about sexual violence? Nobody wanted to talk about this. It had to be glamorized and popularized and sensationalized before we could even have regular conversations about it. I'll take it. People ask me all the time about Hollywood and you know, actresses and what do I feel about that? Those people are survivors too. And in fact, if they didn't have the courage to stand up and tell their stories, I couldn't stand here and tell mine. So I'm grateful. But I'm also telling you that we have a unique historical moment and we will squander it if we let these misconceptions take hold. The way people think about the Me Too movement, the way people understand it is mostly dictated by the media. And the media is getting it wrong. The media is a wonderful tool because we wouldn't be here if not for journalism, if not for excellent journalism. We wouldn't be here if not for mass media. But there's also this element of media that just takes one story and keeps retelling it over and over and over again. And so the misconceptions versus reality are really our biggest challenge. This idea that this is a movement about taking down powerful men, my God. <laughs> Irritates me. And it, irritate, it should irritate men, honestly. It should irritate everybody. But men, you should be irritated at, the, at a couple of things. You should be irritated, one, that people think that you have such a lack of self-control and such a, a, a short grasp on, 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 on basic decency and humanity that you can't function in the era of Me Too. It's ridiculous. <laughs> There's this, this shift that has happened, and all of a sudden, all men are casted now. It's like, oh, I see boobs. Oh, I just got to touch them when I see them. It's just not true. It doesn't mean you don't have a shift to make. It doesn't mean that behavior doesn't have to change. But it definitely doesn't mean that this is a gender war. This idea, also, of just highlighting individual bad actors is problematic. Whether we're talking about Kavanaugh or Weinstein or Moonves or R. Kelly, it's problematic to keep singling out individual people and talking about them as though they're a bad apple. Because there is no way that you can have a Weinstein or an R. Kelly without a whole bunch of people around them making that happen. And really, you get to be a Weinstein or R. Kelly and operate the way that they did because there are people who are more invested in the bottom line than they are in human dignity. Our conversations really should be talking about what happens when you have an unchecked accumulation of power and a misuse of privilege. These are the same things that happen that allow racism to happen, economic injustice to happen. When people have unchecked accumulations of power and they misuse their privilege, it's never good. So we have to reimagine and rethink what privilege looks like and what we do with it and how power is shared. We have to put systems in place to not let people, we are so obsessed, let me tell you something, this is a kind of an aside. Obviously you know the, the, the Michael Jackson documentary has come out about uh, leaving Neverland. Regardless of where you fall on the spectrum of believing or not believing, what I have witnessed in the last month 
of the people who support Michael Jackson is disgusting. And it's mostly disgusting because no human being should be above reproach. So these people, you may not believe Michael Jackson's a molester, that's fine. But the death threats and the vitriol and the, the people who are just like, will, will die on this hill. People who never stepped foot in Neverland, never met that man, will die on this hill because he's a pop star. It's a problem. It's a problem. So this little thing is going to run out in a minute, so let me get to the good part. Um, Me Too is a global community of survivors committed to healing and action. I want you to take that line with you. We are a global community of survivors committed to healing and action. Anything outside of that is a distraction. It's distracting you from that bottom line. And our work centers survivors, especially the most marginalized amongst us, including queer and trans folks. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can clap at that. Our work is about guiding people towards individual healing resources, and our work is to interrupt sexual violence through community action and community healing. Now, I talk about healing a lot. Um, individual healing is not something that anybody can tell you, right? I can't tell you individually what you need to heal. What I can tell you is healing is possible and it's lifelong, it's ongoing, it ebbs and flows. I can give you all kinds of information about what healing could look like. I can help connect you to resources, which is what we're trying to do. Any number of resources. But individual healing is your personal journey. Community healing is very different. Community healing is the things that we define together as a community. It's very concrete. We're talking about laws and policies and culture and practices. We get to define that together. This is a community. I know that, how many people are students here? Raise your hand if you're a student. Okay, it's a good amount of students. So I'm just gonna, okay. We, we always learn, aren't we? <laughs> But whether you're a student or not, you deserve safety and you deserve protection. And that should happen in your community and that should be defined by the people in your community. And if you're on a campus or not on a campus, there should be an inherent commitment to making that happen. When I looked up um, information about British Columbia, because I've never been here, this is what I found. Now I gotta put the glasses back on. This is mostly gendered because the information was mostly gendered. It was a lot about violence and women, so I'm sorry I don't have information about men or trans folks or non-binary people. Um, but it says here, over half of women in British Columbia have experienced physical or sexual violence by the age of 16. And that's more than one million people in the province. Every year in British Columbia, there's over 60,000 physical or sexual assaults against women. Almost all of them are committed by men. In British Columbia, there are one, over 1,000 physical or sexual assaults against women every week. Over 60% of British Columbians personally know at least one woman who has been sexually or physically assaulted. And only 12% of sexual assaults against women are reported to police with one in three women likely to be sexually assaulted in her lifetime, which is really the statistic everywhere. But here's the other one that sat with me about indigenous women. The exact number of indigenous women and girls who have gone missing or have been murdered in Canada since the 70s is uncertain, with estimates ranging from approximately 1,000 to nearly 4,000. But we know better because it's probably double that. In response to activists, the Canadian government funded data collection on missing and murdered women that ended in 2010. The Native Women's Association of Canada, Canada had documented 582 cases since the 1960s, with 39% occurring after 2000. But of course, advocacy groups say that, more, that many more women have been missing, with the highest number of cases in British Columbia. A community is only as safe as its most marginalized person.
And so if you are passionate about this movement, if you are passionate about ending sexual violence, you have to be passionate about black women and brown women, indigenous women, disabled women, queer women, queer people. I'm sorry, I should have said people in all of those instances. So what's next? I think I'm gonna save the what's next when we sitting down because I really am like probably 15 minutes over, but I'm gonna end by saying this. There is no silver bullet. Yes, the hashtag was amazing. The hashtag galvanized people and the hashtag got us here, but a hashtag is not a movement. There's no silver bullet, there's no one hashtag, there's no one person that is going to end sexual violence or save us all. It really is going to take everybody doing what they can at capacity to just move the needle. So what I'm asking you is don't be distracted by the media. There's noise, there's a lot of noise in the media. Pick the good stuff, leave the rest alone. Don't be distracted by the noise in the media. Don't let other people tell you who and what this work is for. I get letters from people every day who said, I wanna be a part of the Me Too movement, but I feel left out. And my answer to you is that you cannot be left out. You will elect yourself out, but it's yours if we say it's yours. If you say it's yours, it's yours. If you say I'm a part of the Me Too movement, I'm bringing this group of people in, I represent this group of people, it's yours. Nobody is isolated. Nobody is left out. Yes, I talk about centering black and brown people. Yes, I talk about centering the most marginalized, but it's not to the exclusion of anybody. In fact, we should want the most marginalized to get first because it ensures that everybody gets what they need. Nobody would be left out. And also, don't celebrate me. And there's a lot of celebration of individuals, right? People love the, you know, the, the singular charismatic leader and everybody's like, oh, sexual violence, let's bring Tarana Burke. And it's great and I'm grateful for it, but it's, I don't have a use for celebrity if it's not going to advance this work. So don't celebrate me if you're not going to stand with me in this work. Applause don't mean anything if you're not going to, I know he's about to clap, <laughs> sorry, my bad. I appreciate your applause. I do. I'm going to take the applause to mean that you agree with that point. <laughs> but do get involved, even if you think it's small. Whether it's a change in behavior, a conversation with your family, a checkup on policy, school accountability, get involved. I ask people all the time, do you know the sexual harassment policy at your job? You know it exists because folks have to have, is that a, that's a law here in Canada, right? Okay, good, I figured y'all are better than us, so. <laughs> but people know that the sexual harassment policy exists, but how many of you know what it says? You know what doing the work looks like? It looks like getting a cup of coffee or a bottle of wine or whatever it is, and sitting down with a group of folks, print out that policy and read it back and front. And then compare it with your lived experience in that place. Would it cover what you've experienced or what you've seen? Are there holes in it? You don't have to start a riot, just have a conversation. Say, hey, listen, we looked this thing over and it would be, it would be probably, it would be good if we updated it a little bit. Maybe we should talk about adding this or that. How many of you know about the people that your children interact with from the time they leave your house to the time they come back home after school? Teachers have to be vetted, substitute teachers have to be vetted. What about the person who works in the cafeteria or drives the school bus? I'm not telling you to grab your pitchforks and go up to the school and <laughs> act crazy, but I'm, I am saying that we all can be more vigilant. We all can play a part. There's that one person in your family that at Thanksgiving was rubbing you the wrong way and you told your kid, you bumped them on the table, said, just be quiet. Because they were like, oh, this Me Too thing is ridiculous. It's getting out of hand. Have a conversation, have a hard conversation with that person. And you know, don't let them drive you crazy though because people will try. <laughs> My point is though, everybody can be involved. Don't let those people who raised their hands almost two years ago keep their hands raised. This is our movement. This is our time. 
do recognize the urgency. There is an urgency. I don't know how long we have. I don't know how much space we're going to have to keep talking about sexual violence, to do something about it. So we have to act now. There is an urgency. One of my very good friends, Dr. Imani Perry, who's, I think, one of the most brilliant thinkers of our time, has a quote in her new book that says, awareness in and of itself is not a virtue without a moral imperative. This is our moral imperative. And so I'm saying to you, let's work together. Let's heal together. If you are ready to do that, I can only leave you with these two words. Me too. I was waiting to get to this seat. <laughs> well, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Thank and you. I will just ask a couple of questions before turning it over to our audience. I already have some uh, interesting and provoking questions uh -oh. here on my tablet. Um, but for the audience, just, um, uh, just to remind you, you have questions that are submitted on Slido. They are being approved in the back. Um, you should be seeing all the options by now. So please continue to input questions and also to like questions that you would like answered. Um, and I'll get to them in a couple of minutes. But so my first question is, what's next? Ha! Huh. <laughs> so, you know, I think people don't, what happened when Me Too went viral is that everybody was kind of like a deer caught in headlights, right? Um, even national organizations that already existed didn't know how to respond. And so we didn't see people coming to help folks get a container to process. It was just a lot of spilling out on the internet. So one of the things that, that I've taken my time to do over this last year and a half is to build an infrastructure around Me Too that is specifically about doing this work different. Meaning we have programs that will roll out that will be, that people can replicate in their community. Um, we are really, really promoting survivor leadership. So within our organization and also in the work that we're doing in the community, we have survivor leadership training, um, and we also have community healing circles that can be replicated. It's, I, I hate, it's the, the, the closest comparison I have is kind of like AA. Mm -hmm. You know, people can be trained and then and start those programs in their community. Um, we're also building what I am just claiming to be uh, now the world's largest database of resources for survivors. And there's a, there's a lot of information for survivors on the internet, but it's all over the place. And a lot of it is very traditional, if you will. And so if you are not a person who will go to a rape crisis center, for instance, but you would go and do Reiki or take a yoga class, or there's, there's, there's literally, this is not an exaggeration, there's literally a knitting motorcycle club of survivors in Ohio in the States. <laughs> right? But that, it speaks to the fact that people need different things. And so we, wanna, we are like scraping the internet and going out and doing surveys in public to get, in person rather, to get that information and, and put it in one place so that people can figure out, what, help people figure out what they need. Um, the other thing is helping people, like I can, I can make a call to action very easily and rouse people to their feet and get them excited. But what happens afterward, I, I, I used to say all the time in my talks, um, you know, look for the gaps. Go in your community and look for the gaps in your community. Look and see what's missing. I stopped saying that because a woman said to me once after, she came up to me and she was very excited and she said, I want to look for the gaps. I hear you. I'm ready to get started. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I've never done this before. And I thought, you know, I'm operating from my own bubble. This is second nature to me. And so now we're creating in partnership with some Canadians, actually. It's a group from out of Toronto. We, um, I'm so, I'm such an American, right? <laughs> Some Canadians. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. Um, but yeah, we're creating a tool to help people figure out what action looks like and how to get active in their communities. So 
this, we're an organization, and I think people don't understand that. I, when, when Time's Up formed, a lot of folks thought that was the answer to Me Too, mm -hmm. and it's not. It is a separate organization that has a separate agenda and a separate vision even. And so it's taken some time to help people understand that we are an organization and we are trying to set the narrative and the vision you know, forward for the organization, for the work. Thank you. Well, um, as a reader, I have to go back to the beginning of your talk and ask you, because you were raised, you said, by a mother who, who taught you the, the canon of black feminist literature. Yes. So could you name some of the influential texts? Oh my gosh, yes. I was, listen, I was reading Toni Morrison and Toni Cade Mambara mm -hmm. and Audre Lorde and not too much Bell Hooks. I probably read her a little bit later, but definitely Maya Angelou and Alice Walker mm -hmm. and those people when I was very young. Mm -hmm. My mother was taught by Audre Lorde. And so she had a, a very close connection to her. And so we talked about that. We, we, I, I had memorized, oh, and Tazaki Shange, which is who later became like a mentor to me. But I had memorized the whole For Colored Girls book and really the album. By the time I was like 13, I didn't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> I was just, so, but it did shape who I am, very mm -hmm. much so. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I ran a, a literary organization that essentially honored these women um, when I grew up. Well, I'm teaching Toni Morrison's Paradise this week, oh, so uh, yes. everything you were speaking to resonated uh, uh, powerfully, and I know yes. my students will, will make the connections tomorrow. Um, so let's go to the audience question, and the first question um, the audience would like to ask you is, have you had any backlash from the White House since your February 28th <laughs> interview on Yahoo Finance in which you called Trump a self-admitted predator? Oh, that wasn't the first time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't, no. <laughs> I mean, you know what's funny? You know, I have people now, right? I have, like, people who advise me about things to say in the media, even though I never well, I do listen sometimes, but <laughs> because, and they're like, "Well, be careful." And it wasn't even like they try to, to they try to edit me, but um, you know, Trump supporters are just really rabid. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got a lot of like backlash online the first time I said it, but also in a very like kind of brass tacks way, if a person says, "When I see a woman, I grab her by the pussy." <laughs> I, I didn't make that up, right? Like, you said it. And so I'm just calling you what you are. Mm -hmm. you, that's, that's, there's a law. Like, you, you run the country. You should know the laws. <laughs> like, it's not just like, oh, we frown upon that. No, that's actually a crime, right? So you are self-admitted. And, and he said it, he does it to multiple people, which then makes you a predator. That's also just like, that's like science. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I got some backlash, but not from the White House directly. I, um, last year, I was invited to the State of the Union, actually, but I declined. Um, I was invited by a Democrat, mm -hmm. but I declined just because I couldn't sit in that room. And I said I would go if they let me dress in all black and wear a veil over my face. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, no, we can't do that, so. <laughs> So our next question is, what would you say to white women about supporting women of color in movements such as these? You know what? I think that the best example for what white women can do in this moment is Alyssa Milano. Um, Alyssa Milano gets a lot of flack still, which I think because people just don't listen to me when I try to say this, and I, I get it. You know, there's a lot of tension over the years, rightfully so, between white women and black women, particularly around support in, in movements um, and in feminism. But what Alyssa did when she put out the tweet, she didn't know about me. Um, it wasn't an intentional try, you know, attempt to like discredit me or take something from me. And when she found out, within 24 hours, she, one, corrected herself, which is like on the record, even though people don't believe me. <laughs> like, she put out a tweet, she apologized. She actually, this is how people found out about heaven, because she took that link from my website and tweeted it out. Thank you, Alyssa. And um, she did that, and then she contacted me and said, how can I help? I didn't, she apologized and said, I didn't know, I'm sorry, how can I help? Um, within four days, three, day, three or four days of Me Too going viral, we were on national television together. And even then, they like pre-recorded me in the corner, I was just like a little blip in the corner, and they had her live, and so she said on national television, we wouldn't be here if not for the work of Toronto Burke. 
And so I use her as an example often because what white women can do to support women of color in this moment is to pass the mic. Mm -hmm. When you get it, you should not be speaking for us. You should be helping to amplify us, mm -hmm. right, around our issues. I mean, mm -hmm. so that's the best thing you can do. Mm -hmm. There are there are wonderful examples of what allyship looks like in this moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you should look to those examples. We can speak for ourselves, but a lot of times people, even when wh wh white women mean well, other people elevate them. It's, it's kind of like the thing with Hollywood, right? People mm -hmm. want there to be a conflict between me and the women in Hollywood. Those women go out of their way, <laughs> really. They go out of their way to say, Tarana, here, you know, to bring me into spaces where I would not be. But what happens is the media keeps saying, like, listen, I was sitting still, minding my business. <laughs> and even after Me Too went viral, I started getting, like, I was getting press, but I was, like, on Democracy Now!, which is, like, yeah, Democracy Now! comes up here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, every left-wing person in the world watches <laughs> Democracy Now!, that's not, like, a new audience, right? <laughs> of course I could go on Democracy Now!, but, but it, was, it was the... Um, these actresses who were pulling me into these other spaces and, and trying to get the story right. But the media was kind of like, uh, let's see, black woman, 44 years old from the Bronx. Do we have anybody else? <laughs> and there was, not, there was literally just not people in the moment who can contextualize what was happening or, 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 or add context to it to help people understand why they were saying me too about empathy and about these different things. So it just... Mm -hmm. It happened because of these, um, this wonderful allyship. So these are examples of what white women can do. And this is what I tell white women, pass the microphone. Thank you. So have you reconnected with heaven after the Me Too movement took off? And are they aware of the impact they had on your life and st in starting the moment? No? I am on a, so uh, I'm still very connected to people in mm -hmm. Selma. It's like my other family. And so I had a conversation last year, actually it's almost been a year, when I was visiting about helping me to find her. Mm -hmm. And what we, pro what we figured out is that she probably was the family member of another one of our campers. And so, you know, I, I've been moving so much we didn't really follow up, but I think if we can find him, I think she's probably his cousin. Mm -hmm. But also, I had another friend say to me, you know, you need to stop, no, I'm not obsessed with having by the way. <laughs> but he was like, you know, the, other, the flip side of this is she may have walked away and never thought about you again. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like, oh my God, I ruined her life. And, you know, she's like 35 right now. And I just hope that she has, um, I hope that she got what she needed, even though I couldn't give it to her in that moment. Because there is something that happens when you open up. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that she opened up that once, I just pray that she didn't close back up and never open up again. Mm -hmm. um, I think about that often, but yeah. Hopefully I can find her. Which leads to our next question, which I think is, is, a, is a really powerful one. Mm -hmm. so empathy is not possible when we doubt our victims. And why do you suppose that people doubt others? Sexual oh, assault stories. That's a, I mean, that's just a sort of a big question. I think there are lots of reasons why people doubt. There's one of them, one of the things that I've learned this year that I just didn't realize that I was naive about is how little people know about what survival looks like. Right, and how little people really, how, we have been watching Law and Order SVU for 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, I told the young people earlier, it's my favorite show, even though it's problematic. <laughs> it is my favorite show though. But, um, but television has given us a very finite understanding of what a survivor looks like, what a survivor should do, how they should act, how they should behave. And so when people don't fit into that box, people, other folks say, oh, well, you're not, look, look at you, you're, you know, you can't possibly have, it couldn't have been that bad, mm -hmm. right? And so I think there's, that's one reason why folks doubt. Um, I also think that we've been socialized to, to victim blame, mm -hmm. right? And so the questions that come up immediately is, what did you do mm -hmm. to bring this on yourself? Mm -hmm. It's a very hard thing to talk about. It's a hard thing to accept, you know, I remember when I first told, so my daughter's a survivor as well. And I remember when I first told her father, and it was several years later, and his response, he, he kind of went off the rails, yelling and screaming and so upset about, I want to kill him and do all these things. And, I, and it just was all about him. It was all about his feelings about not being able to do something about it in the moment. 
And I think that it's easier to either doubt the person, to, to act like it didn't happen, to push it aside than it is to really deal with what is happening and to, to be in the moment and be present for somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's a really difficult thing. We take it for granted, but it is a difficult thing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, building empathy, when I talk to folks about building empathy for survivors, I try to connect it to other things other than sexual violence, mm -hmm. right? People understand dignity, right? Especially when I talk to men, Dignity is important to people, and it's very important to men in a lot of ways. So when I, think, I think, when I say think about the things that would strip your dignity away, and what lengths you would go to to protect your dignity, right? We're talking about basic humanity. And so trying to help people connect to what the pain of sexual violence feels like, um, what that, what that, uh, the inhumanity that you experience, what that feels like, so they can understand how to have empathy for survivors. And, and also, this is about changing the narrative and shifting what we see in popular culture about what survival looks like, right? It doesn't all look the same. People are, again, I hate to bring up Michael Jackson because it's just, it's just the topic right now, or even R. Kelly. People look at the, the survivors and say, this is not what a victim acts like. This is not what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So the one guy from, from, from Wade Robson, Robson who's accusing Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, he's a con artist. He lies, he cheats, he's this and that. I'm like, do you think that, that because somebody's molested that they don't do those things? Or maybe they do it because they were molested. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make you, there's no such thing as a perfect survivor, mm -hmm. right? And so it's just, we need a lot of, um, re-education around what that looks like in order to help people build empathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about brands capitalizing on the Me Too movement, yeah. such as the short Gillette in their new ad? I haven't seen that. Yeah, the Gillette ad caused a bunch of controversy. I think that Gillette actually did it in a way that's more respectful, though. Mm -hmm. I think that I've seen some, some little swarmy stuff that's not quite respectful, but if you're going to be, and, and, and this is something I actually really struggle with because I've been approached by a lot of brands and a lot of companies mm -hmm. and things like that. And I mean, I'm like, I can't be like a spokesperson. I can't be like, come to Target because, <laughs> like, like, like that would be kind of janky, right? I, I just, <laughs> but, but I have been, I've been in these conversations in these, in these big corporate um, spaces about this struggle because mm -hmm. corporations don't want to be seen as, um, uh, co-opting or, or, you know, what is the word I'm trying to say? Not co-opting. Appropriating. Appropriating or, or it's something with a C. I can't think of this word. Like, capitalizing. Capitalizing. Thank you. <laughs> Smart people in Kelowna. <laughs> On this movement. And, and, but they also want to respond to the moment. Mm -hmm. And so I think what Gillette did, so Gillette had this ad about, what was the, tag, the tagline was like, what's their regular tagline? Mm -hmm. was, there you go. Be, best a man can be. That was already their tagline. What they did was they created this like short movie where they showed these instances where like uh, kids being bullied and fighting or men being um, like harassing women and stuff like that and talked about men being better. And there was this incredible backlash of men saying that it's condescending and you know, um, men don't need you to tell them how to be better. And I'm just like, y you kinda. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit, you know, and it doesn't, but also I think that it doesn't, it didn't, it wasn't really condescending to me, in my opinion. I'm not a man and maybe, you know, I know y'all are in your feelings about it, some of you, but I, I honestly couldn't get it and I asked my male friends and one of my most conservative friends, I always go to him with this kind of stuff, <laughs> and he said, well, I get it a little bit because most men want to come to this on their own. And I said, but if you're not, how do we nudge you a little bit? And so I think that in those ways, there should be a corporate response to Me Too. There should be a response from, from some of these big companies around Me Too. Um, but it should be thoughtful, and it should be in line with an ethic that is, um, that is moving the, the message forward and not just like capitalizing on it. Mm -hmm. If y'all send me the Target commercial, don't talk about me though. <laughs> 
Well, we can talk more about uh, corporate culture, but uh, the question is, how can we tackle the larger systems in place that make racialized individuals, women and gender queer individuals, more likely to be abused? This is, you say, say it one more time. How do we tackle the systems yeah. that make racialized individuals and queer, queer individuals more likely to be abused? Mm -hmm. So this is part of this work, and in, in that specific work, is about allegiances, I think, in some ways. I think that we have to work... We talk about intersectionality a lot nowadays. We have to work across lines and at the intersection of some of these issues. And so I, I did a talk last year at Facing Race where I talked about there's no issue that you are involved in that is not also a sexual violence issue. Whether you're dealing with housing or healthcare or mass incarceration, it, sexual violence is in there. And so when we're dealing with racial justice, we have to deal, there's an element of dealing with sexual violence, it's about racial justice. And so again, when I, when, when I deal with um, setting up with the, the framework for Me Too, the reason why I talk about centering those people is so that people start thinking and understanding that, you know, there's an old saying, and they said, I don't know if this, they say it in America, I'm gonna stop doing it, I'm sorry. Um, that, you know, if, if white folks get a cold, uh, then black folks get the flu. Have you ever heard that? You ever heard that? Okay, well good, I got one on you. <laughs> but essentially it's like, it's, it's kind of like what I was saying about the missing murdered um, indigenous women in my talk, that if, it's, if, it's, if the statistic for white women is, you know, 22%, it's going to be 44% for other folks, and having to keep that at the forefront, mm -hmm. keep bringing that information, keep bringing those people, keep bringing that issue to the forefront and letting people understand that this, these issues are not just singular, mm -hmm. that we, when we talk about ending sexual violence, sexual violence, I say this all the time, it doesn't discriminate. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no demographic you can name that is not touched by sexual violence, but the response to it, the response to it is what we have to dig into, mm -hmm. right? And so the response to it is why it only took two articles to bring down a Harvey Weinstein, and it took 20 years, seven exposés, an international movement, and a six-hour documentary to get people to talk about R. Kelly, mm -hmm. right? That's the difference that we're talking about, and we have to keep bringing that to the forefront. Mm -hmm. What strategies can we use to support parents whose partners have perpetrated sexual violence against Ooh. the children? Well, one, get rid of them, obviously. <laughs> this is, goes without saying. Um, oh, I said get rid of them. Yeah. Let's start with, that's just a baseline. Um, but there are some organizations, I, I really I hate to bring up Michael Jackson again. But one of the things in that documentary that I think was really poignant was about the parents, the mothers. Um, has anybody seen it? I keep talking about it. Raise your hand if you've seen it. A few people have. Okay. So, uh, the Neverland documentary, the Leaving Neverland documentary about Michael Jackson. So one of the big issues in there is about the mothers and, and their um, response to the, what happened to their sons. There are some organizations, there are not very many, but there are some organizations that are sort of popping up to help parents. I'm, I am in this a very interesting position because I'm a survivor. It's not a lot of people are, but I'm a survivor who's also the parent of a survivor. Um, and so it was when, my, when I came to this place of understanding about what happened to my daughter, excuse me, that I shifted how I talked to parents about um, sexual violence and about supporting their, their young people, their children, and also supporting themselves. There are a lot of support groups, and you can also you know, start them. You find other people and start them, but it's really important that we have open and honest conversations about what it is to parent a child who is a survivor. Um, oh, you asked about the partner, though. And that's, a, that's a super specific thing. I mean, I would, Im I would imagine there's some counseling in there that, that has to happen. Um, and support groups that have to happen. There's, you know, lots of um, layers of things that go on when you have incest in the family. So, yeah, that's what I would suggest for sure. Well, and the follow-up question is, how do you, how do we talk to the children, and what kind of language do we use when we're talking to our children? Well, that's really important. So when I, this is the, this is what I meant about um, shifting my language. My daughter was assaulted when when they were. Um, six and 
I, well, five, I'm sorry, five. Mm -hmm. It took six years, so when they were five. And it took six years for me to get them to tell me, even though I knew what had happened. I didn't see it, but I could tell by the shift in their behavior. I, could, I was doing this work, I just, I knew. Mm -hmm. And so my initial response to them was, did anybody bother you? Who touched you? Did anybody, did anybody mess with you? Tell mommy, right? And I kept on at that. It was, and I was, I was so crazy. I was like going to the school thinking the teachers did it. I, pulled, I literally pulled my child out of a school because I was convinced that it was a teacher in the school. And it just took so long for me to get the right language. And finally, when they were 11, it just, I, just, I just say this was God because it just came to me to say to them, I was doing, I was doing their hair and I said, you know, there's nothing that you could ever do to separate you from my love. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And there's nothing that you can't tell me. And it was similar to how I talked to my, the kids in my program, and then I gave them a piece of a paper and a pen, and I said, if you have a story to tell mommy, write it down. And that's how they wrote down and told me what happened. And I realized that I, as a parent, was, was in another headspace, and I didn't think about my child the way I would have thought, you know, thought about myself. Because I was asking, did anybody bother you? I was asking the wrong question. Because, we, and this is just, this happens in communities of color more so than others, but I think everybody does it. What parents, this is, I'm just gonna say this quick, I know we're running out of time, but when we talk to our children about sexual violence, we a lot of times heap a lot of rules on them, particularly girls, right? So lots of us were raised with these rules that say, don't let anybody touch your private parts, don't sit on a man's lap, right? These things sound familiar, you don't. We get a litany of rules that say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, right? So one, we put the onus on the child to protect themselves, but we don't, a lot of times we don't say, if one of those rules is broken, it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. And so when the child, the child breaks the rule, if you will, they're holding it. And so what happened with me and what happened with my daughter is that we felt complicit in our own abuse. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like somebody did something to me. I felt like I broke a rule, mm -hmm. a really big rule. Mm -hmm. And so it, it changed the way I talked to parents. So, so what I tell parents when, it, when you talk to your children, and also it doesn't help to say, if somebody touches you, I'm going to kill them, right? It, it doesn't help because children understand consequences. Mm -hmm. You're at, simultaneously, we're also teaching them about consequences. They know what jail is. Mm -hmm. They know that when you kill somebody, you go to jail, right? So you don't want to put that in their mind either. It is very important to teach your children to be vigilant but not fearful, Mm -hmm. So when you talk to your children, you should talk to them about what vigilance looks like, about being aware of their surroundings, about, you know, good and bad touch, all of the things that we know, but they have to be able to walk through life feeling free mm -hmm. and not be feeling like they're, they're scared of everything around them because something might happen. It's a very fine line, but when, I know this sounds sappy, but really we love our children. And when you come from a place of love and protection that is not, fearful, you're out of your own fear and speaking from your own fear, then you reshape that conversation. Be clear. I was very clear with my, my daughter. Like, this is not okay. If somebody does this, it's not okay. I think we have to, we can't dance around it, right? People, children have to know. This is not okay if somebody does that. And more so than touch, let me just say this one last thing because this is something I'm passionate about. More so than just about good and bad touch, we have to train our young people to recognize grooming because people groom children before they touch them. Mm -hmm. And so when, when you have a situation where there's somebody paying an extra amount of attention to your child and trying to lure them in different ways, we have to also give them information about what that looks like, mm -hmm. right? And so that they don't, when somebody's trying to put a wedge between you and your child, which means that we have to be vigilant about those relationships. So, I mean, it, it, it's a lot of work, mm -hmm. but also, this is what we're here for. This is why we're parents. Well, yeah. I'm afraid we're out of time, and I, I want to thank you. But I'm before sorry, I, I ask you to join me in thanking uh, <laughs> Tarana Burke, I'd like to just thank the audience for your participation. Thank and you, your, Kalona. Your excellent questions tonight. And also to those who joined us via live stream. Um, and just a couple of notes. We have a, a booth in the um, foyer 
uh, the UBCO Sexual Violence and Prevention Office booth. So for anyone who's looking for support or information, uh, that's available to you there. And our final slide of the evening will also provide you with some uh, community-based resources and contacts. Um, and one last request uh, I have here before you go to take out your mobile devices one more time, um, because UBC Connect would appreciate your feedback. So you can log on to Slido and um, say and nice the, things about hit the me. polling tag. But <laughs> but but more importantly, please join me in thanking our guest for our powerful Thank speech. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> ah, thank you.